Awesome. I'd like to now introduce the facilitator for our next panel discussion, Siobhan Proctor, Chief Infrastructure Officer at Wellington City Council. Siobhan Proctor has over 20 years experience in the electricity industry, specialising in investment analysis, asset management and project engineering. In 2018, she became the Transport and Infrastructure Manager at Wellington City Council. After working as the three-year program director at Let's Get Wellington Moving, she was appointed as the Chief Infrastructure Officer at Wellington City Council. In her current role, she is responsible for approximately $10 billion worth of assets, including roading, property, waste and water. I'd now like to welcome Siobhan Proctor. Kia ora tātou. So um, I didn't really want to follow that act. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Um, so just a disclaimer here. Uh, what my presentation lacks in terms of digital imagery um, to stun you, we make up for uh, with our panel, with a witty repartee and no holes barred insights into the problems that we're facing, but more importantly, the solutions that we're putting in place to address them. Right, Wellington's a city in transition at the moment. We're on the cusp of a once in generation change to take Wellington from where it is now to being a more resilient, vibrant city in the future. We're still very much in the early stages of that. And over the next 30 years, we're going to be welcoming between 50 to 80,000 new residents into our city. We wanna be able to house those residents in affordable houses which are also resilient. We've got a fairly well-defined plan for how we're gonna do that. We want to build on the compact urban form that has seen our city thrive from the absolutely positively vibes of the 1990s through to the coolest little capital of more recent times. But our challenges, like all cities, are significant. Responding to the climate change emergency, our aging infrastructure, and the needs of a growing population. So just to illustrate the level of work that we've got coming at us, we'll go to a very simplistic map with dots on. These yellow dots represent all of the consented developments across the city. Add to that the gift of having 590 earthquake prone buildings, which need demolition or remediation within the next decade or so. Add to that, which I can't because it's not working. Here we go. Our award-winning Panake Ponake, which is our bike network plan. So this sees us looking to build 110 kilometers of temporary and permanent cycleway over the next 15 years. And then our water infrastructure. Aging, reaching its capacity and frequently failing I think we all know the challenges that this is going to present for all cities across New Zealand over the coming years. And lastly, the biggest dot of all, our Let's Get Wellington Moving program. This is a $7.4 billion investment program, which is going to see us revitalize the Golden Mile, which is the premier retail precinct in New Zealand. It's going to see us upgrade the connection from Waka Katahi's extremely exciting Te Ara Tapua bike lane, which is going to connect the Hutt City to Wellington City. It's going to see us spending around 350 million on upgrading bus priority, walking, cycling facilities across the city in a city streets program. And then the very big investment is the investment in light rail, which will see us build light rail, a 13 kilometer light rail corridor from the station through to Island Bay. And it's this corridor that's going to unlock the much needed development cap urban development capacity that's going to house the predicted population growth. So it's an essential piece of the plan. So all of this investment is going to happen along our road corridors. It's going to interface either directly or indirectly with the underground environment. And this is what we're here to talk about today. It presents both a challenge and an opportunity. So you can't plan for what you can't see. So we're looking to create a system where we can see the unseen. 
over the coming years, we are going to have the opportunity to excavate and observe an unprecedented proportion of our subsurface environment. And this opportunity presents us, this um, access presents us with an opportunity to capture and record everything we find. So, and many of you may have heard this before, we want to move away from legacy records, paper-based processes held across many locations to an online map-based library. And what we need to do, we heard from Graham about a federated system, is develop a federated data sharing platform which shows all of our subsurface infrastructure, which is owned by both council and other utilities. And that platform will be made available to everyone who needs access to it. So it's often referred to as a federated subsurface asset register or subsurface digital twin. So we just want to be clear, the asset stewardship stays with the asset owner. We would just be collecting this data and making it available in a consistent form. So it's pretty obvious what enhancing our knowledge of the subsurface environment will yield in terms of economic benefits. And I'm sure our panel will um, provide more information of where they see the advantages of this. It's going to reduce rework. It's going to help in times of disruption. It's going to improve our resilience, our asset management capability. And most importantly, it's going to help reduce the risk of service strikes. So building the library is one part of the solution. And it's kind of the sexy part because we'll get to look at what's under the ground. We'll be able to visualize it in 3D um, and it will help with the design and planning. The less attractive piece which we will be um, implementing is the regulatory function that we have. So as a local authority, we do have the regulated powers to ensure we receive this information and up-to-date, accurate data in a timely fashion. Um, I would challenge any local authority across the country um, as to whether they exercise this power. It's the power they have as a corridor manager. Um, but in order to make this system work, we are going to have to start exercising those powers. So it's our role as the local authority to make this system function. So the legislative framework is there. And also to be clear, a private enterprise doesn't have the powers to make the system function, only councils do. So we've stood up our corridor manager function. We're working through how we establish the processes to require that data and to collect that data. Um, and we are aiming to have a beta version of the federated database up and running by June next year. And whilst we're focusing very clearly on Wellington's challenges and our city's immediate needs, there is, of course, a case for this to be adopted across New Zealand. So an initiative such as this puts us on the road to consistency in practice and process. If it's going to work for us and New Zealand, we need to commit to the principles of open data, open standards, recognize that this is for the public good and recognize the significant public benefits it will deliver if we get it right. So our mission covers two simple things, to improve the timely access to accurate underground asset data and to enable a functioning system to improve the quality and certainty of that data. And it should be fairly simple. And my panel today is going to talk about how simple it is and what we should be doing to make sure we can all take advantage of this. So I would like to welcome, firstly, Blake Lepper. He's the General Manager of Infrastructure Delivery at Tiwahanga. In this role, Blake is responsible for shaping the strategic context for infrastructure investment to ensure that as a country, New Zealand builds the right things at the right time, in the right way, in the right place, but also actively manage the infrastructure assets we already have. He's got a background in delivery of major infrastructure projects and had quite a hand in the delivery of this facility we're in today. Passionate advocate for getting better value from our infrastructure investment by ensuring the government is an intelligent client of infrastructure and is designing and delivering our projects in a coordinated and coherent way. He joined Tiwahanga after a number of years supporting the government on the recovery and regeneration of Christchurch following the 2010-2011 earthquakes. Do we have a round of applause? I feel like we need a bit. <laughs> 
Um, next, another great New Zealander, Dave Dunlop. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> He's a major projects director for a WSP. He's got over 25 years of experience in transport planning, urban planning, and project delivery. As major projects director for WSP, he primarily delivers large-scale, multidisciplinary transport projects for our clients, partners, end users, and communities in which we live and work. He has recently taken on the role of Alliance Director for the TT Waitamata Harbour Connections um, in Tamaki, Makara, Auckland. He's leading the indicative business case, which considers all transport modes, specifically mass rapid transit, active modes and freight. Prior to this role, I had the pleasure of working for Dave in, as when he was acting programme director for Let's Get Wellington Moving, working with Waka Katahi, Wellington City Council, Greater Wellington Regional Council and our Mana Whenua partners. Welcome. And last but not least, we have Matt Thomas. Hey, Matt. Chair of the Digital Built Aotearoa Foundation. He's also a consultant with TGBC, providing advice to large infrastructure delivery programs. So I said to Matt, I'll introduce him as a bit of a hurricane chaser. Um, wherever there's a disaster, he seems to be there leading the, the recovery. He was responsible for the design and establishment of the processes and systems for both the Christchurch Horizontal Infrastructure Rebuild Alliance following the 2011 earthquake and also the Kaikoura Transport Infrastructure Rebuild Alliance following the 2016 earthquake. And no surprises, he's currently advising on the establishment of the East Coast Recovery Alliance following the flood events early this year. He's a strong advocate for systems which provide enduring capabilities, and he is the chair of the newly established Digital Built Aotearoa Foundation, a charity established to be a home for technology and knowledge gathered from our experience of disaster recovery to make this available to all New Zealand. Welcome. Right, we'll get underway, so please keep your questions coming in. But I'll start off with a question for Dave. Dave, you've been on the front line of lots of projects, major projects. What do you see as the challenges of not knowing what's under our ground? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so I think when I got really involved with this was when we started to see um, what was coming out of Sydney um, and George Street. Um, and certainly um, some of the challenges that were occurring over there. Um, and uh, in the context of Wellington, um, we saw we actually needed to get this information early. Um, so we got, um, we engaged um, Reveal to do um, a, a really um, detailed um, survey of that data. Um, and in doing that, um, that gave us the, the start of a journey that we went on with Wellington City Council. Um, and, I, and I guess the, the key there was not just about getting the data, it was actually forming the group um, in which to do something with the data. Um, so Wellington City led the charge of forming the group um, and um, as a result, um, we, we got all the players together um, and, and we, we, every time we, we met, we went through where the works were happening and understanding what the future planning was um, for, the, for the different projects. And I guess to me, you know, even the basic um, curb realignments, yeah, you know, we've all encountered um, the delays associated with it, the costs for overruns and the likes. Um, having this information available and, and for everyone to look at really makes the, the, the job so much easier. Um, and, and it's really about ability to avoid um, as well as um, a much safer outcome and a more cost effective outcome. I think we were reflecting earlier that, you know, um, Years ago, for my sins, I was the program manager at Queenstown Lakes District Council, and uh, we had to do all the street upgrades, and it became a forensic, almost archaeological dig, trying to work out where everything was. We didn't know what was live. We didn't know where anything, all the clashes were. Um, we were putting spades through things that we shouldn't be putting spades through. Uh, it all became very expensive and very timely. And, and it's happening again because the Queenstown is now going through a whole upgrade program. And because we didn't have the systems and the tools back then to do it all, they're doing it all again. So another archaeological dig to try yeah. to find everything. Yeah. So Blake, what's Tiwahanga doing in this space? I mean, that's a really good question. And um, I, I think one that we're probably struggling with a wee bit, because from our perspective, it feels like the case for this was made a decade ago. And since then, it's only become more useful, the data, cheaper to collect it. Um, you know, we, we did 
great stuff with Skirt a decade ago when this was much less mature. Um, so in many ways, as the Infrastructure Commission, I'm puzzled as to what more we could do to build the case um, for doing this. But it really does seem that you know, we have a fundamental issue with some of the system settings, that, that we don't encourage the basics. We don't encourage um, the kind of bread and butter. And we saw that yesterday, Ross's pre presentation kind of highlighted some of the asset management challenges we have. Um, you know, we're not good in lots of our sectors of, um, you know, making sure we know what we've got um, and are looking after it. And who would have thought that case was so hard to convince people that knowing what their assets were um, was something that yeah. it was difficult to convince people to invest in. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. just seems so obvious. So, you know, I'm interested, you know, yeah. what can we be doing as an infrastructure commission to further build the case for it? Because it seems to me that it's just... Yeah, I think the case that's been built, like we've done a business case, we, so we're using better off funding to fund this. So about $4 million of the better off funding that we got from the water reform to build this. Um, and our business case is a, it is a no brainer. Mm -hmm. You can see the benefits very, very quickly. Um, I think, you know, there's a, probably a question of leadership in this space and who takes the lead, who builds the system, who looks after the system. You know, we're very focused that we will, we will do that for Wellington City because we have a burning platform. But I'm just curious as to, whether you think there's an alternative? Well, I mean, I, I think we do have to, to work really closely together on this, and I think that's the only way. We can only do it, I think we, we heard today, if we're capitalising it into our projects, that's where yep. the money is and it does yep. cost something. So, um, you know, that presentation earlier today was one that I've seen before, because um, in October last year, we took the leaders from Auckland Light Rail, mm -hmm. additional Waitamata Harbour Crossing, um, Let's Get Wellington moving over, to, to um, cross River Rail and had a look at that model in the flesh, stood in the virtual reality room and understood the value of it. Um, you know, we don't need to be reinventing this. We've got some great standards. Why can't we just be lifting and shifting and using what's already working? What's stopping us from doing that, Dave? <laughs> good, really good point. <laughs> well, sometimes it's just the real basic, like what's written into contracts, just things like that. I mean, ultimately, I think you're right, though. It's about that leadership. You know, if we really step up and, and say, look, this is good for all of us. Um, and that's one thing I have witnessed with Siobhan and the team. Um, you know, there's been some real ownership from Wellington City Council in trying to drive this forward. Um, and, you know, it, it shouldn't be that hard. It should I mean, be really it's, easy. It, it's one of those things, though, isn't it? It's all built on good leadership, and it's built on good people and good process. Yep. So we've got twice now we've tried to come up with a, a standard for water. Years ago, one got created. It didn't work very well, or it didn't get adopted. Then we've tried again. We tried University of Canterbury, tried to build a national database of pipes. But it seems as if the the leadership above the people, the technical people who were involved in the, in the thing were so distanced from itself, unlike the previous speaker who probably would have grabbed it with both yeah. hands. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just got to a bit of a crunch point where my way is better than your way, so I'm going to keep on doing it my way, and, and it, it never really eventuated. Yeah. So it, how do we overcome that? It's, I think it's more than, than a policy setting or, or a contractual setting. It's about how do we get the right leadership and the right people involved. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's take a question from the floor. Glasses on. I want my question. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this is good. So, and we've got expertise here. So how can we better leverage off the learning of the skirt recovery, which did much of this one model work? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what happened at skirt was, was we, we had a bit of a plan at the beginning about what we wanted to achieve, similar to the previous um, speaker. Um, how do we get all of this information, all this data and everything together in, in, a, in a cohesive way? Um, and, you know, I just was in the background a little bit and there were some amazing people around us who were just given the, the, the ability and the, and, the, and the freedom to go and make it work. Um, and so all of a sudden, all of the things that we think we needed, we just started to build. Mm. So we started to build processes, we started to build standards, we started to engage with the, the surveyors, and we started to engage with uh, all of the design resource. We built a, a, an underlying data model, pulled it all in, put it all onto a GIS viewer. Um, we, we negotiated with all of the local utility companies. They gave us all of their data. We put it all into one place, mm. um, and we created the skirt viewer that um, 
everyone came to love um, until the end when we had to turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it, the, the client was in a, in a way with so much legacy and so much, so many other things going on, they weren't in a position to take it on. Mm. So when Skirt ended, most of that information left, was left in a can somewhere. I mean, the aspects of it were picked up, but, you know, there are other things that, that we did which have endured. So um, we created a Ford Works Viewer, which is now the national Ford Works Viewer. So incrementally, we're hoping we're going to build that and grow that out. That's part of the Federation's um, tool set is, is allow organizations to share where they're working and when they're working. Yep. Um, that also augments the sort of the pipeline view and, and all those other things. So, so things are starting to coalesce. Um, but also at Nectar, you know, when we were doing the Kaikoura rebuild, um, one of the, the things that really sort of confounds me a little bit is, is literally the people who were doing skirt, finishing skirt, moved out of the building and Nectar moved into the building to do Kaikoura. But nothing got transferred over. No intellectual property, um, only the people. And yeah. so the people then got on board. And so we had, to, we had a new challenge. We had a very short time frame to build everything and so it wasn't built to the same standards that we had built skirt but it still worked so we built um real-time monitoring of slips and and um, integrations with google maps so we could understand travel times and a whole bunch of other bits and pieces we built um some data models that that persisted um and nectar is going to uh sign its final certificate next month and they're going to sign the paa for the east coast alliance next month and nothing will be transferred from either Skirt or Nectar into the new alliance. Um, and and it's, it's partly because of uh, the contractual model in that all of those systems, all of those tools, all of those processes, all that capability has grown within an alliance, but it's all built in, in, on various organizations infrastructure and within their, within their environs and within their control. And none of it is owned by the client. And so when it does end, the client has got nothing at the end. And so again, similar to the, the, to the previous speaker, the, the, it, it's all left out there and none of it is now with the client. So we're hoping now with the East Coast Alliance that, that that's going to be different. So we're going to try and build in clients infrastructure and all that good stuff. But yes, yeah, so what was the original question? Um, what, <laughs> what did we learn from Christchurch? Well, we learned that we can do it and we've done it and we know it's doable. Um, it's just we've got to do it in a sustainable and a long, longer term view now. Yeah, and I think, you know, you, you sort of touched on it, didn't you, that it's all around the client has to have the information mm. and the client has the benefit of having that information, yep. so needs to really demand it. And also, you know, is there then the case that you have the local councils doing it for the local roads and Wakukatahi doing it for the state highways? How does that work? So going on to the next question from the, from the audience. So why are we not doing this at a national level, led by a central government agency? We've only got one central government agency here. Go on, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the thing is that it has to be usable. I mean, we can create standards and policies around data, but unless it's used, it's a waste of time. And I think that's what we've seen so often is we create this policy, we get the data created, but unless you've got a customer, unless you've got someone demanding it, unless someone you want it to use it, then it's just useless information. So I think that to me is the thing is somehow we've got to get people demanding this type of information. Tell me about my assets, mm -hmm. you know, engage with my stakeholders. You know, I want that thing that allows me to do that, that thing. That's what to me is going to shift the dial. Um, and that's never going to come from the, the center. That has to come from people who are out there at the front line, talking to people, making those decisions. Um, you know, we've, we've debated this, I think, internally. We, we've considered whether or not we need to come out with a BIM mandate and specify all these things. Um, we're having a look into what's happened overseas when that's happened, but it feels like the value case for this is just so strong that the stick is the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. um, surely it should be the carrot. Surely it should be the benefits of, of these things that, that really is what drives this forward. Um, and it feels to me that you know, if we could get this stuff available, make it more publicly available. And the public has paid for all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it should be there as a resource that yeah. can move from one project to the next. But I think there's, there's also this, this almost, when you get new graduate engineers and people coming into the industry, and they go, well, what do you mean it's not there? <laughs> How can I not find it on an app? <laughs> yeah. well, why can't I do this on, on my phone? And then you go, well, 
you know, there's a, there's a long history here. We've got hundreds of years of, of, of information and systems and tools and processes. Rail was still working off paper-based forms from 1954, you know, when Nectar started up. Um, they've now moved, moving towards a digital model. So, you know, that, that, there's a huge amount of legacy to overcome. Um, and for organizations like Waka Katahi and, and Rail to transition from what they've currently got to what the new world would look like, mm is a big ask and, and it needs a considerable amount of, of, of effort and investment. Or do they think of it a different way? Do they think about it and go, well, let's create a brand new thing and incrementally move to the new thing yeah. rather than try to change their common MO. So, um, you know, that, I think that, but that takes leadership and that takes some, some, someone to be quite brave. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think yeah. I, in, in, in my opinion, that's the only way you're gonna be able to do it properly. Yeah, and I happen to agree with you, Blake. I don't think this is a central government thing to lead. I think that it has to be led by the people who are going to benefit from it, and the people who will be benefiting it for the people who own the data already because they've paid for it already. Mm. Um, and I think uh, local authorities have a significant role to play in this because, you know, these are the, our cities that we're planning to develop um, and regenerate. So actually, we're the ones who should be making sure we're taking the initiative. But we're going to need help financially. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Mm, should this be, so one for Matt, I guess. Should this be part of the National Ford's work viewer so that we have assets and projects visible in the same space? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Easy. Thank you yeah. for that question. <laughs> yep. So, so yeah. I this this is the thing, isn't it? Is is um, you know, at the local level, um, you're right. Wellington or Christchurch or whatever, um, trying to trying to show or coordinate and federate all of their data amongst a bunch of key stakeholders and, and organizations. I think that's right and appropriate and, and the level of information, the granularity of that information could be quite deep. Mm. But when, when you're trying to think of how do I federate that at a national level, you know, what will, do we know, one, do we need all the data or do we just yep. need some parts of the data and, and then how do we share that with everyone in a common format and a common structured way? Um, and again, the, the ongoing benefits of not just, you know, the dial before you dig kind of a, of a, of a, of a scenario, but it, again, it goes back to the, the forward works and, and giving the pipeline and the certainty of the industry about what needs to happen. But also, you know, the people who want to know what's happening in my street, mm. you know, that's one of the most important questions that people can't answer mm. is what's going to happen yep. in my street and when and, and what are the issues and what risk am I at? Yep. And where's my money going? You know, and all the way up to well, have we got enough engineers and we got enough people, you know, to do all this work? And we've got uh, an avalanche of work coming at us over the next 10 years. Your program, mm -hmm. the rail program, East Coast, the resilience program, all of these major programs, we're going to be significantly boosting the amount of effort we've got to do. We've got echoes of investment, as the Auditor General discussed it, with all of our infrastructure starting to fail. You know, we've had underinvestment in our roads. So it all points to this massive wall of work mm. and we are not alone because America is like it, Europe is like it, everyone else is like it. So we can't poach people and, and things. So we're going to have to prioritize in a different way, think yeah. about things in a different way. And if we can't share information in, in, a, in, a, in a cohesive way, then we won't be able to make those right policies. Mm. We won't be able to prioritize and people won't know what's happening in this street. Yeah. So yes, put it all in forward works viewer. All in forward work viewer yeah, at I a national level. Forward works viewer is a great example to talk to. Um, when I was here, it was a tool that, that I used all the time. And I'm sure there was a policy that said I had to use it and, and put my data in it. Yes. But I, I never read that policy, if I'm perfectly honest. But I used it because it was useful. Yeah. When we were trying to do the services relocation yeah. around here, I wanted to know what else was going on. And therefore, we looked in it. And we didn't want to be disrupted. So we put information in there So because we, we knew other people would see it. And I think you know, that's what we've got to do. A wee bit like that story we've just heard. We've got to take what is working and continue to build on it um, because that's how we'll get um, to where we need to be. Well, we've got a national uh, geotech database, mm -hmm. you know, which, which is, in my opinion, underinvested mm -hmm. um, and has got massive benefits that haven't been exploited yet by the rain and, and the flood events up north yeah. because they haven't had access to it and there's no policy around you must do this to the benefit of everybody so there's lots of things out there we've got lots of capability we've got lots of tools lots of learnings but we don't seem to leverage it mm. we don't seem to bring it up yeah yeah question for you off the back of that dave yeah, yeah. what are you doing in your current program around this area yeah, yeah. What are you um <laughs> to be honest very little right about now 
Um, but there is a huge amount of data, as you say. <laughs> I, I'll agree. I will, I will be honest. I'm just, yeah, we, we aren't doing a huge amount um, because we, we don't even know which line we're taking and where we're going. Um, so, and that was one learning, um, even though it led to a lot of good data being collected in Wellington, mm, mm. Um, we did end up doing some survey in areas that didn't result for the for the actual project and where the project was going to go. However, what happened with it is at least it got fed into into a, into oh, Wellington City Council. Found it really and, useful. Yeah, exactly. So it has, yeah. it's you know you can you can do the data, you can get the data, and and it's it's available, but not always utilised for the purposes of the specific project. Yeah. But as long as someone takes it and owns it, then that's that's a huge benefit. And I think the important point is, you know, we've got these big projects as we heard from Graham earlier, you know, on the back of the big projects, get the data, um, but utilize it and, and share it, and make it available. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the key messages, isn't it, around um, it doesn't actually matter about that quality of that data right now. We just need to start collecting it, storing it, and improving yeah. it, and improving it as we go, because we're never going to get it to absolutely perfect um, straight away. And sharing it. And sharing it, yeah. yeah. OK. Oh, okay. Let's have a look. As soon as a line is drawn in a model, people think it is to millimeter accuracy when it could have been digitized from old paper plans. How will you manage expectations around this? So I think for, um, again, that's something that we need to work through with our utility providers as well and how we improve I think it goes back to what I was saying before you know we're, we're not expecting it to be 100% um, accurate straight away but it's about making a start and recognizing that this is a marathon not a sprint um, it is going to take time to get that and to get that confidence um, but I think and maybe we'll move on to what, what the panacea is then you know what would I'll ask each of you what do you think the ultimate would be which, from just sort of talk. in response to that question, Siobhan, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's multiple layers in how you, so you, obviously, when we did it in the context of Wellington, we scanned it, mm. um, and, but then we obviously then went out to the utility providers and got, put the other layer on, and then obviously, if you're about to go and dig, then you obviously go to the next level and get, you know, ensure that it is yeah. what, you've, what you've got and verify it. Um, so I guess that, that that's the, the checking process, um, but the key is you've got to keep it real and got to keep it live. Yeah, so um, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just give an example of how we've used that data. So even mm. though it wasn't 100% accurate and you couldn't rely on it to avoid a service strike, for instance, you'd still need to pothole. Mm -hmm. um, the data that we, we had for Geovoice Key yep. um, showed that there were some real anomalies in the water network mm. then. And then when we had to uh, replace that wastewater pipe, it was over, as Tonya here, over, over, over Queen's birthday weekend a couple of years ago. Um, what we'd managed to identify from looking at that subsurface scan data is that there were some significant portions of concrete under the ground so actually managed to inform the construction methodology that could be used and meant that we could do that piece of work Wellington water could carry that work in sort of record time with minimum disruption to the city so did it over one long weekend did it in three days rather than spreading it over and actually finding those issues when you've got the ground open so finding those issues before you open the ground has huge benefits from a design and planning and delivery perspective so I think it's there so going back to that what is the panacea Um, I think I'll, I'll go back to the previous speaker. He, he, you know, basically said that we write it in from the beginning, from here on in. Every, pro every project we do, from design through the construction, we want information gathered in an electronic way. The, the panacea would be that each of our major clients would, would actually then develop their own internal capabilities to accept that data mm -hmm. and to be able to do, you know, eventually do something with it. You don't have to be doing something right now, but so we've got. Uh, as I said, we've already got a national forward works view. We've got a national geotech database. We, we, we've got all of these things in place. We just need to just do it. Do it. <laughs> yep. Nike. I mean, I think the exciting opportunity for me is not just, um, you know, what happens when we collect this data and what it means for us up on stage. I, I think the most exciting part about that Cross River Rail story was um, that stakeholder engagement. Yeah. You know, the thing that worries me most in infrastructure right now is we seem to be losing this tangible understanding between our communities and our infrastructure. It's not something that people are arguing for. It's something that feels like an imposition. Mm. Um, 
And that was the thing that struck me when we went and walked around um, the, the stakeholder engagement exhibition in, on Cross River Rail was it was about inviting people into the infrastructure mm -hmm. process. It yep. was about giving them the opportunity to feel involved, feel ownership, um, feel part of how it was going to change their city. Um, and I think that's, you know, the most exciting thing about some of this technology is we can, you know, read democratize infrastructure, we can re-engage with people on infrastructure, because that to me is what we're going to have to do. We have to get back that social license to be able to deliver infrastructure because we have such pressing needs and they are so urgent that unless we can engage people in that process and make them feel part of this sector, um, we're going to really struggle to achieve what we want. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point that, you know, we need to take away is, you know, the engagement aspect of this and how we can engage our communities with this as a tool will be actually really compelling and will actually make the likes of let's get one of moving programs far more palatable um to the naysayers what about you dave well yeah i mean that's sort of just coming out of the ground now but um it, for me um it is about bringing um it, you know if we produce business cases and the likes it's actually making them real making mm. people it what what is it in how does the user and in, in the public um, actually experience they don't read a PDF full of you know thousands of pages what you know what's the story and how's it told in a digital way yeah. so this is way above the ground it's, you know, <laughs> it's it's definitely about you know us as users us as the public that experience but it is really important in, yeah. in how we how we move forward yeah. but I think if people looked at a map of our water infrastructure Wellington's water infrastructure if you could show them the age of it, when it was put yeah. in, what if risks it's subject to. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a completely different conversation yes. when it came to mm -hmm. setting maintenance budgets, setting rates increases. Yes. So it is only by telling that story, mm -hmm. by making it real for people, that we will get mm -hmm. the funding we need to look after these the, these assets that are so important to our lives and livelihoods. Yeah, and I see probably one step on from that is once you have this information and you have some confidence in the information, you can then start adding the other layers like age, condition, um, targeted report or optimized replacement time. And then you've got that for water, you've got it for power, you've got it for your telecoms. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you can actually, suddenly take a long time to actually have this joined up cross sector planning from an asset management perspective, which will make everyone's lives so much easier. It will definitely stop the thousands of calls we get coming into the Wellington City Council, which is why are you digging up my road again? You only did it three weeks ago. Um, but if we did it once, we did it right, that would be the ultimate, well, but it I also, think. It also underpins the whole planning around resilience. So if you don't know what you got, how can you plan for resilience? Yeah. So how would you see this if, if it was fully functioning, helping in, for instance, like the East Coast moment going into it? Uh, now that's a question. <laughs> no, sorry, we didn't rehearse that one either. Um, well, right now, I think there's a lot of very, very intelligent people sitting in a room trying to work that bit out. Yeah. I don't think everyone really knows how to solve it yet. Yeah. That's going to be unpicked over probably five to ten years. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, could, could have been avoided had we had a model like this in place. Not the disaster, obviously. The... <laughs> um, one more. We've got three minutes left. Um, oh, is there a role for AI here? Well, I mean, there's wow. going to be. This is going to change be. our industry. And um, we will not be forgiven in five years' time if we haven't collected data. You know, it is going to be data that feeds AI and that's going to drive process improvements, productivity performance. It's going to help us model this very uncertain world. Um, and I think, you know, people working in this industry in five, 10 years time will be so upset with us mm. if we're not collecting the data that mm. we have access to now, because it is going to be so important for unlocking some of these really important tools um, that are just moments away in the overall scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think we'll leave it there on the on that thought of people are going to be really upset with us if we don't act now and do something with the data we've got. So any utility providers in the audience, we really want your data. We're going to come and get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we have the powers to do so. Um, OK, so if you could, thank you very much, panel.
for coming thank today you. and thank you um, for listening and paying attention. I know it was a difficult after lunch spot. Thanks very much. See ya. Well done, guys.